Welcome. Now, you may be here because you've seen a time-lapsed video in which a frantic Nick Angler turns this elegant rolling pin in less time than it takes to roll out a pie crust. Well, in this video, I thought we'd slow down a little so that I can explain exactly what I'm doing. In fact, I thought we'd turn this into a lesson in basic lathe turning. Now, don't worry. There's plenty of tips here for you experienced turners. But I often use the rolling pin to teach lathe turning because if you can make this, you can turn almost anything. This is a classic Queen Anne pedestal table that I made some time ago. The turnings that make up the pedestal base and the cage, uh, well, they took some time. But in reality, they were no more, no more difficult than this rolling pin. And that's because in lathe turning, there are only three possible shapes that you can make. You can turn your cylinder flat or straight, like here or here. Or you can make it bulge out, make it convex, like here or here. Or you can make it curve inward, make it concave, like here or here. And that's it. So all those beautiful turnings that you see are just combinations of three shapes. Flat, convex, and concave. That's why I say that if you can turn this rolling pin, you can turn almost anything. Of course, you need to know what tools to use and how to use them. Lathe turning is done mostly with lathe chisels long chisels that give you the leverage that you need to control how the chisel meets the wood and to keep it there. Now I've gathered six chisels here that I consider the basic set that you need to make flat, convex, and concave surfaces. A roughing gouge used to round the stock and to create that first rough cylinder. A skew chisel which is used to create both flat and convex shapes a shaping gouge, which can be used for all three shapes, but it, uh, it really shines on concavities. Notice that the ears or the sides are cut back here, unlike over on the roughing gouge. This is so you can reach down into deep valleys. A parting tool used to part or cut the turnings as you turn. Uh, this is also really handy when you need to turn to a precise diameter, and it can be used for small flats. A uh, round nose chisel, which is handy for deep concavities. And unlike other chisels, this really shines when you're trying to turn end grain at the end of the cylinder as opposed to the flat grain along its length. And its uh, cousin, the square nose chisel. Like the round nose chisel, this is good for cutting end grain. I'll show you how to use all of these chisels on the rolling pin, but there's one more thing that you need to know. There are two ways to cut with these chisels, as I'm about to show you on this practice cylinder. You can shear the wood, shaving it like this. And here it is again in slow motion. You see that? You're holding the chisel so that it shaves the wood. This gives you the smoothest possible cut. Or you can scrape the wood like this. And here it is again in slow-mo. As you might guess, scraping takes longer and produces a rougher surface. But it's also a good deal easier than shearing. If you're just starting out as a turner, uh, you'll probably begin by doing a lot of scraping. It's easier. And then you'll work your way into shearing as you gain more experience. However, you should know that you can create any of these three basic shapes flat, convex, concave, by shearing or scraping. It's your choice. Any turning project starts with preparing the stock. And uh, this is going to take a little extra time because we're going to glue up several different species of wood to create the turning blank. We're going to take advantage of the differences in color to create the visual effect that we're after. Each piece is 3 inches, that's 7.6 centimeters, by 20 inches, or 50 centimeters. All of different thicknesses, but we need enough to make the glue up 4.5 inches, or 
11.4 centimeters wide. We're even going to use a piece of plywood in this turning to make use of the color difference between long grain and end grain. This is Baltic birch plywood. The layers are evenly spaced and there are no voids to contend with. When applying the glue, don't be stingy. Make sure that every piece of the surface is covered. You don't want the stock coming apart while you're turning at high speed on the lathe. I use a threaded bolt to help spread the glue. The threads act as teeth and help spread the glue evenly, much more even than you could do with a brush. Use plenty of clamps and plenty of pressure to hold the layers together while the glue cures. Most adhesives need clamping pressure to form a strong bond. Make sure there's glue squeezing out from all the seams, and once you've applied all the clamps, go back and tighten them again. As the glue squeezes out, the distance between the wood surfaces shrink, and the clamps get looser, maybe too loose. So go back and tighten them up. And you might want to wash off as much of the squeeze out as you can with a sopping wet rag. This will save time later on. Finally, let the glue cure for at least 12 hours. Most glues don't achieve 90% of their cohesive strength for at least that long, and they don't get to 100% for 24 to 48 hours. Once again, we don't want this stuff flying apart on the lathe. Once the glue has cured sufficiently, scrape away any squeeze out that you didn't get with the wet rag. Now, ordinarily, the glue squeeze out wouldn't affect your lathe turning, but we need this to sit flat on a table saw for the next step. We glued up the stock so that it is uh, three inches by four and a half inches by 20 inches. Now that's uh, 7.6 centimeters by 11.4 centimeters by 50 centimeters for the, those of you who live in the metric world. Now we need to rip this down so that it is exactly three inches, that's 7.6 centimeters square. And we're going to rip at a four degree angle using this simple tapering jig. This four degree angle is one of the things that makes this finished rolling pin so visually striking. Make the first rip with the jig, turn the stock 180 degrees, and make the second rip with the fence. Finally, square the ends. The turning stock should be at least 19 inches, that's 48.2 centimeters long. Let's get ready to mount this stock on the lathe. First of all, we have to find the center by drawing two diagonal lines from corner to corner at each end. Then we drill a shallow 1 8 inch diameter hole, that's actually a 3 millimeter uh, hole for you guys in metric world. And finally, we make an impression of the lathe center on each end of the stock. There are two centers, a drive center, which drives the stock and keeps it turning, and a cup center, which allows the stock to turn. If your cup center has a bearing, it's often called a live center. Place the center with the point in the hole that you just drilled and wang it once or twice until the spurs of the drive center, or the cup of the cup center, have made an impression in the wood. Notice that I'm using a brass hammer to do my wanging. If I used a steel hammer, it might peen over important parts of the centers. The brass is much softer than steel, so the only thing that gets peened is the hammer itself. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now let's do some lathe turning. Set the tool rest so that the corners of the stock don't hit it when it rotates. And set the height so that the tool rest is just below the flat surface of the stock. Check your setup. We want to be sure that the speed is set correctly, that the stock doesn't hit the tool rest, and the stock is not too far off center. That's pretty good. It's running pretty smoothly. No excessive vibration. You, you don't always get the centers right where they should be, and sometimes uh, it vibrates dangerously. Uh, when that happens, there are two things that you can do. You can either slow the speed down to reduce the vibration, or you can take the stock off the machine, uh, mark new centers, and put it back on again and see if that works. 
but this is pretty good, so let's wade into this. The first thing we need to do is turn this rectangular piece of wood into a cylinder. I'm going to use a roughing gouge to knock off the corners and create that cylinder. I start at a very slow speed, 500 RPM. If this were a bigger turning, it would be even slower. As the stock gets round, it will be better balanced and I can increase the speed safely. Feed the chisel slowly. Don't try to remove too much stock at one time. That bears repeating because it's the whole secret to lathe turning. Feed the chisel slowly, gently, gingerly, just a little at a time. Let me say it again in big red letters. Feed the chisel slowly. Some turners like to knock off the corners on a table saw, turning the rectangular stock into an octagon and then rounding the octagon. I'll do this for a large turner, something larger than four or five inches. That's uh, 10 to 13 centimeters in diameter. But for small stuff like that, it's not necessary. Notice that every now and then I stop cutting with the gouge and lay it across the cylinder that I'm creating. This is to check to see that if it is a true cylinder or if there are any flat parts left. If there's a flat somewhere, it will cause the chisel to vibrate. Okay, we now have a rough cylinder and I'm going to do something to make it just a little less rough and a little more true. Uh, you remember when I told you that uh, most of lathe turning is done with lathe chisels? Well, every now and then it makes sense to switch to other cutting tools that you may have around your shop like this uh, number three smoothing plane here. Watch this. The plane smooths out the highs and the lows, making the uh, cylinder a lot straighter. If you do this, be sure to set your plane for the thinnest possible cut and hold the plane so that the iron is at an angle to the axis of rotation. Now that we have a cylinder, we have to turn it down to exactly two and three quarter inches in diameter. That's seven centimeters. I'm going to readjust the uh, tool rest so that it's closer to the cylinder and it's still just below the surface that I'm turning. To turn a cylinder to a precise diameter, it's traditional to use metal calipers like this. You set the distance between the two arms to two and three quarter inches or seven centimeters and then you start turning. When the tips of the calipers slip over the cylinders, you're at the right diameter. Now this works well, but I like to make wooden calipers for all my turnings. These are made out of one quarter inch or six millimeter plywood and I'm going to show you how they work. I don't ever have to reset these wooden calipers. I can use them while the lathe is running and I never need to worry about the metal jaws scoring the wood. Notice that I've put a little notch in my caliper. That's a warning notch. When that part slips over the wood, I know that the turning is within 1 16th of an inch or about one millimeter of the diameter that I want. If a precise diameter is critical, and it really isn't on this particular project, I can slow down and creep up on the, on the diameter just to get it right, which is kind of what I'm doing right now. You'll notice that I'm using a skew chisel to shear the wood and kind of creep up on the two and three quarter inch or seven centimeter diameter that I'm after. We have the diameter of the cylinder where we want it, so it's time to make the handles. Now the handles are two and a quarter inches or a little less than six centimeters in diameter. And they are three and a half or a little less than nine centimeters long. Once again, we want the tool rest a little below the surface diameter that we want to turn. By the way, this is just a rule of thumb, not something hard and fast. You should put the tool rest wherever it feels comfortable for you. The rolling part of the rolling pin is 10 and a half inches or 27 centimeters long. So let's find the middle of the rolling pin cylinder, then mark the location of the handles. This will also delineate the waist at each end of the cylinder. 
I'm using a story stick that I have made from a long scrap just for this purpose. The rolling surfaces, handles, and waist are all marked on the stick. If you want to make duplicate turnings, a story stick and the wooden calipers that I showed you will go a long way towards making them all the same. Use a skew chisel to make cuts that delineate the rolling section from the handle sections. This will keep the ends of the rolling section crisp and keep them from chipping. Take a parting tool and turn grooves at the inside ends of the handle sections, using another calipers to make them all the proper diameter. Next, turn the diameter of the waist down as small as you can go without turning past the drive center or the cup center. Go back to the handle sections and turn those two and a quarter inches or six centimeters in diameter. Use the grooves that you turned before to help you judge when you've reached the correct size. Notice that I'm using a mix of chisels to turn the waist and the handle's diameters. Once again, there are no hard and fast rules here. Whatever works is the right chisel for the job. Okay, it's coming together. And now it's time to turn the shape of the handles. To do that, I've made a template from this piece of plywood. This will help me feel my way to the correct shape. And by the way, there's a full-size template in the plans that we offer. You just print them out, stick them down, and cut out the template you need. Use the template to mark the major and minor diameters of the handles. That's the big and the small diameters. The handles are already at their major diameter, but you might want to turn grooves down to one inch or 25 millimeters at the location of the minor diameters. Turn the convex shape of the ball handles with the skew chisel and the shaping gouge, being careful not to remove the pencil line that marks the major diameter. Turn the concave shape in the handle using the shaping gouge and the round nose chisel. That's the part between the ball and the cylinder. Be careful to not cut past the bottom of the groove. In fact, when you can reach the bottom of the groove with a pencil, mark it and try not to remove the mark. You can use the wood layers to judge when the handle is spherical. The layers near the major diameter will form a round circle. Use your template to gauge the shapes of the handles and make sure that both handles match. When you're satisfied with the shape of the rolling pin, it's time to sand it. Now this is done the same way you would sand any other woodworking project. You start with coarse grits and you work your way up to finer. For this particular project, I'm going to start at 100 and work my way up to 180. First, remove the tool rest so you don't catch your fingers between the rest and the turning. I'm going to do the initial sanding on the cylinder with a large, flat sanding disc. This keeps the cylinder true so that later on those pie crusts will come out at a consistent thickness. If you don't have a big sanding disc, simply stick a piece of sandpaper to, the, to a scrap board with spray adhesive. You can tear sanding belts in strips and use them by wrapping them one half turn around the spinning turning. This keeps your fingers away from the wood. To use sandpaper, 
you may want to wrap it around a wad of steel wool or a piece of Scotch-Brite. Sanding generates heat and the sandpaper will get too hot to hold very quickly. The steel wool or the Scotch-Brite insulates your fingers from the heat. You'll notice that I keep adjusting the speed faster and faster. It's uh, just like it was when I was using the chisels. The faster the turning turns, the smoother the surface becomes. And you don't have to use just sandpaper. I often resort to uh, rasps, files, even scrapers. It's all hands on deck when you're doing this step. Now, there were no tight inside corners on this particular turning, so I didn't have to reach into any deep crevices. If I did, I have these uh, strips of uh, sandpaper and various grits that I can rely on. Uh, there's also abrasive cords that you can buy that really get into tight places. And I have been known to take an old hacksaw blade and wrap a piece of adhesive sandpaper around it. This works surprisingly well. We're done with lathe work for right now. I'm going to take this off and do the last little bit of sanding we need to do at the ends. Now, some turners like to finish their projects on the lathe, and I do that occasionally. But on something like this, where you've got multiple woods, you find that the dark sawdust can bleed over into the light areas and make everything too dark. So I'm going to do the finishing on my workbench. Let's clamp the turned pin in the vise. And then I'm going to cut off the plug and complete the handle. Cut off the waste stock at each end with a handsaw, leaving a short plug no more than 1 16th of an inch or 1 and a half millimeters long. Using a rasp, round the, the plug over, making it roughly spherical and blending into the shape of the handle. Then sand the plug with an orbital sander, rocking the sander so as to round the surface of the plug uh, in the same way. Keep the sander uh, rocking, blending the plug into the spherical shape of the handle. Work your way up through the sandpaper grits, stopping at the finest grit you last used to sand the rolling pin on the lathe. Now it's time to finish this rolling pin, and I need to say a word or two about non-toxic finishes, especially since this thing is supposed to be used in a kitchen. Traditional non-toxic finishes include non-drying oils, like mineral oil, walnut oil, raw linseed oil, or raw tongue oil. These are especially appropriate if you're making children's toys or kitchen utensils that you're going to stick in your mouth or use to stir hot liquids. However, there are also many drying oil finishes that penetrate the wood that are also considered food contact safe. The material safety data sheets on some of these chemicals can scare the bejesus out of you. They certainly convinced me to stop pouring Wipe-On Poly over my pancakes. But the MSDS sheets are there to protect the people who apply the chemicals, not the end user. Many finishes react with oxygen or a hardener and form a chemical matrix that cannot be digested and will not interfere with biological processes. These are considered food contact safe, a step below food safe. This is also why we can touch tables and chairs and guitars and a thousand other finished wooden objects and then touch our eyes and lips and not die. If you need a food safe finish, something that you can actually ingest, there are many available to you from woodworking finishing sources. Often these are called salad bowl finishes. Now you'll notice that I am sanding this finish in. Uh, there's a reason for this. Some of the woods that we used here, like the walnut, are open grain woods. They have pores. And if I uh, 
if I sand the finish into them, it forms a slurry with the fine sawdust that I'm creating. And that fills the pores. Preve Later on, this will prevent food particles from getting into those pores. I'm going to show you a food safe, non-toxic finish uh, that you can make yourself. You don't have to reapply as often as you do non-drying oils and you don't have to sand in. You just mix together a little beeswax, carnauba wax, and paraffin in a double boiler and melt it down. I use one part carnauba, three parts beeswax, and four parts paraffin. But you can make up your own mixture, whatever works for you. Paint the melted wax on the wood and then warm it up with a heat gun for a few minutes so it can penetrate deeply into the wood. Wipe off the excess wax and let it cool. You may have to do this several times. Buff the surface with a clean cloth. You'll get a nice soft luster that you just can't get with mineral oil or other non-drying oils. And if you don't want to mess with the heat gun, you can add some food grade mineral oil to the wax mixture. You can buy this at most drugstores. The oil will keep the wax pasty until you apply it, but without the heat, it won't penetrate as deeply. And there you go. You have now turned a rolling pin. You've also made a flat surface, a concave surface, and a convex surface. So, you can turn almost anything.